In the last lecture, we talked about circuit simulation in general and basically the different sort of integration techniques which are used to solve circuit problems numerically. Uh, also went through uh, a little bit of an example using Simulink. Uh, we don't know exactly how Simulink works internally. We know it uses certain types of integration techniques, but it's somewhat of a proprietary algorithm. And so um, what we want to talk about next is we want to talk about how programs like PSCAD work. And PSCAD is in a kind of a special class of programs, which I would refer to as EMTP simulation algorithms, where basically it uses a, a trapezoidal rule approach, which was developed in the 60s, which I'll get into in just a little bit. And so um, this was something that was initially started in the 60s. Uh, and then probably got some you know, initial use in the early 70s, whereas the power system uh, modeling capability of Simulink didn't really appear until the, until like the 90s once the computers were powerful enough to run like the Simulink environment. So this uh, approach using MTP, uh, this is something that actually um, came out like 20 years before, before Simulink, which is why a lot of the modeling behind it is a little bit more sophisticated because people just simply had more time to work on it. So as far as the, um, the way I'm going to organize these lectures, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to set this up where I'll just cover the, the theory first. So part A will be just the theory behind EMTP approaches. And then I want to go ahead and work an example by hand. It's not very long, but I'm just going to go ahead and put that in a separate video just as more convenient to do that. And then I'm going to go through a more extended example using MATLAB and basically show you how you can code something up like this for a, a little bit larger system. So just some history behind the EMTP program. I, again, um, EMTP is short for like electromagnetic transit program. That actually used to be the name of the program. It just it was just called EMTP. But now there's so many variations on this. I think if it uses this original scheme, uh, I would just simply just call that an EMTP program. I mean, you see programs even like ETAP has this now, and then they have a special name, which is a, you know, using letters like EMT, whatever. But this was actually originally developed uh, by a, a faculty, Herman Dommel, in the, in the early 60s. And so this was really back in the early days of computers where, you know, like these computers were programmed in Fortran. We had a lot of limitations as far as memory. The work was originally funded by Bonneville Power Administration. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Scott Myers was involved in this. And if you're not really familiar with how the United States power market is set up, uh, Bonneville Power BPA was set up in the Northwest United States in order to administer the, the hydroelectric dams. And so given that they were government organizations, they had a mission to also support research. And one of these research activities was the sponsorship of this program. And so this started out as a U.S. government funded project. And then in 1984, this research institute, Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI, uh, started sponsoring development, and this EMTP version 2 was, was released in, in 1989 as a result of that effort. So one way of thinking about this is you have the original program thread that, that started with Dommel. Uh, the, the, the initial work was funded by BPA, and what EPRI did is they basically got the source code tape from BPA, and they decided to start another branch as a commercial development for its, for its members. Um, so the early program development is actually kind of split into three different tracks. Um, you had the original BPA funded effort, which turned into the alternative transit program, or ATP, where this is kind of like the communities at large developing this. You had the EMT track started by EPRI, which was turned over to Electrotech, which then turned it over to Hydro-Quebec, which is now kind of being integrated in with Opal-RT. Um, you've got that track. And then there's a third track, 
which kind of started from the Damo work, but was uh, was sponsored by Manitoba Hydro in Canada, which is the PS CAD track. And so we're actually using the PS CAD program um, primarily because there's a free version of that for students and we have an academic license set up. The other thing that's kind of interesting about these different versions of EMTP is a lot of these are going to have some type of real-time simulation capability tied to it. So for example, like the PS CAD, this ties into a real-time simulator tool called RTDS. And then the EMTP RV is tied into the real-time similar Opal RT. And we'll talk about this more toward the, the end of the semester, what these real-time simulators can do. Uh, but the thing you had to keep in mind about EMTP was that this was originally written in Fortran. Back in the days, we were punching this stuff out in cards and loading them into card readers. And because of that, the input files were basically set up in terms of the, the 80 columns that you would have on a, on a card. And so even today, if you look at some of the intermediate files that are produced by programs like PSCAD, you can kind of still see some of this history in there. There's a lot of that legacy code that, that still exists within these programs. So what EMTP does is, it, is it's based on the trapezoidal rule approximation for solving um, differential equations. And remember we talked before when we have like the Runge cutter rule that basically we had K1, K2, K3, and K4, where K1 is based on what's happening at the initial time, and then what K4 is based on is what's the derivative at um, the next time step, right? So basically the trapezoidal rule is sort of between the Euler approach and the Runge cut approach. And so with the trapezoidal rule, what you do is if you have a, a value, like an initial value at time t minus delta t, and you want this value of x at time t, what you're going to do is take one half of the derivative at time t minus delta t, you're going to add to that one half of the derivative at time t. Um, and when you add those together, you're going to multiply by delta t. And what this is, is, this is an approximation for the area under the curve. And so if I, if I go to this next slide, and let's suppose this green line is a plot of this derivative f then basically what I'm doing is I'm taking the derivative at time t naught, in, in the case of this particular diagram, the next time step, this is t1, so I'm taking the derivative here. And then what I'm doing is by taking the average value, what I'm calculating when I multiply by delta t is I'm getting the area in this green curve. Now the error, it's kind of interesting, the error is actually the difference between um, what I would have is the integrated area in gray versus the area under that green curve. And the error is basically um, a little bit positive in this direction and a little bit negative in this direction. And you could see that if I had kind of a linear relationship for, for that green curve, that that trapezoidal rule would give us a pretty good fit. And so this is this is basically what the trapezoidal rule does is you got to have the derivative at time t naught you've got to have the derivative at the next time step and the trick really is well how do i estimate the derivative at the next time step how do i know what happens in the in, in the future and, and how do i work this into my integration algorithm all right so anyway if we're going to build this around the trapezoidal rule then what we can do is we can look at our common circuit elements like inductors and capacitors and we can kind of figure out well if I applied the trapezoidal rule then what would be the equations involved in that and so what we're going to um, do is we're going to just simply you know kind of look at each different case and when I have an inductor basically what we know is that voltage is going to be LDI dt, right? And, and what I want to do for this case is I want to get a relationship between current and, and voltage. One thing I'm going to do in this case 
instead of writing this in terms of VKM, which is a voltage across the inductor, I'm going to set this up in terms of node voltages. And so I'm going to have a node voltage K with respect to ground. I'm going to have a node voltage M with respect to ground. And why do I do that? Well, when we're doing power system calculations, a lot of times what we're interested in is we're interested in these bus voltages or node voltages with respect to ground. We don't really care like what the voltages across a line element. We basically care what these bus voltages are on either side. And so what this approach does is it works directly in terms of nodal voltages that we're going to basically kind of use the same nodal voltages that we would have if we were doing like um, power flow calculations. So I'm going to go ahead and write the expressions up in terms of nodal voltages. And what I can do if I want to set this up in terms of the trapezoidal rule is I'm going to have VK at time t minus vm at time t. This is a branch voltage. This is L di dt. So this is actually a branch current. And this branch current at time t is going to be related to the current at time t minus delta t plus 1 over L times the integral of this voltage difference going from t minus delta t to t. Uh, note in this case that instead of using t and t plus delta t, I'm using t minus delta t uh, for the current time. The next time is going to be at time t. The reason being, and this is the notation that's used in Greenwood's books and papers and things like that. So for the MT approach, the, the notation is, is a little set up a little bit different for the integration. But anyway, if you apply the trapezoidal rule, then basically if I want to get the area term, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this derivative at time t minus delta t divided by 2. I'm going to add to that derivative of time t divided by 2. I'm going to multiply all this by, by delta t. And so this is basically the trapezoidal approximation for that inductor. What you do next is you go ahead and you write out this branch current in terms of all these other terms, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this up into terms that are a function of time t and terms that are a function of time t minus delta t. All right, and you've seen a little bit why I'm doing this. So I'm breaking this up into terms uh, associated with what I know now at time t minus delta t, uh, and I'm I'm in terms that I want to find at, at time t. And ultimately what I want to solve for is I ultimately want to solve for vk and vm at time t. So anyway, what this equation is telling us is basically that this inductor current at a given time is going to be a function of the voltage across the inductor at time t and current and voltage at the previous time step. And, and one way of thinking about this is that if I want to do this calculation for the inductor, that the inductor kind of has a memory associated with it of what went on at a past time. Resistor is not the case. It's, it's always an instantaneous voltage versus an instantaneous current. But inductor and capacitor have memory associated with it because they're, they're energy storage devices. So what I can do is I'll take this equation and given I'm going to break it up into two parts, what I can do is I can say, okay, now I, Km at time t, this is going to be delta t over 2L times Vk minus Vm plus I Km at time t minus delta t, where we call this a history term. We call this a history term. And this history term I capital I Km is T minus delta T is equal to the actual current at time T minus delta T plus the voltage that we had at the at the previous time at, at T, T minus delta T. Okay, so I wouldn't uh, make too much out of this right here. I mean, as far as a physical meaning for it, it's just a it's just a mechanism for for setting up a solution, um, but it is a function of the branch current and also the pass voltage. So 
now, if, if, if these are the relationships that we have, and this is based on the trapezoidal rule, one way of remembering this is to set this up in terms of an equivalent model. So basically, we've got an expression that's a function of voltage difference and also a function of past states. And what I do, and we want to think about this in terms of an equivalent model, is I can think about this as an element that has a resistance of 2L divided by delta T. And having this history current term, um, capital I KM, it, um, evaluate at time T minus delta T. And so here's this an equivalent model that I can just use to kind of remember these equations. All right. I do the same thing for the capacitor. So what I do for the capacitor in this case is on the left hand side of the equality I've got the difference in node voltages. The voltage is going to be equal to what I had at the previous time step plus the integral times 1 over C going from T minus delta T to T. What I do is I put this in terms of the trapezoidal rule so basically derivative at time T minus delta T um, derivative at time t, divide them by 2, um, you know, this basically I can go ahead and apply the, the trapezoidal rule in this case. And what I'm going to get in this case, if I rearrange the terms, what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for this term, I'm going to rearrange the terms, and we get this branch current time t can be approximated by 2C over delta T times the difference in node voltages minus the branch current at time T minus delta T minus 2C over delta T times the difference in voltages at time T minus delta T. Again, we see this is a function of time T. We see this second part of it is a function of what was going on at T minus delta T. And just like we did for the inductor, what we can do is we can think about this as an equivalent circuit. And so I just went ahead and just, uh, you know, map these equations over to this particular page. And the way of remembering this would be that I've got this resistance, equivalent resistance, of delta T divided by 2C, and this history current term evaluated for time T minus delta T. The models for the capacitor and the inductor look very, very similar. They both have a resistive, equivalent resistive element, and they both have current associated with them. But look at the differences on the resistance term for the inductor. It's 2L divided by delta T, and for the resistance is delta T divided by 2C. And so they're flipped. So that's one thing you got to watch out for when you're working homework and exam problems, is we basically um, have to flip these values, okay? So anyway, let's take a look at how this would be used for a, a simple circuit. So here's a circuit, and I've got two energy storage elements. I have an inductor and I have a capacitor. I've got a voltage source on the left, and I've got a current source on the right. And these are both just time-varying voltages and, and in current sources. Uh, I've got a resistor in the circuit as well. Now normally if you were going to solve for something like this kind of using a state approach you might choose the capacitor voltage as one state maybe the inductor current could be another state although you, you already kind of know the the current on the right already. Um, so maybe you really only need to use the, the voltage across that capacitor. But But anyway in general, what you would have for circuits is the capacitors would give you states associated with voltage, the inductors would give you states associated with current. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to solve this using an EMTP uh, trapezoidal rule approach. And what we are going to do is we want to set this up in terms of node voltages V1 and V2. So you take this particular circuit and you map everything over to its EMTP equivalent model elements. And what you're going to get then is the resistance simply stays a resistor because 
resistance is just an instantaneous relationship between voltage and current. There's no past history. However, what we need to do for the inductor is it has an equivalent resistance of 2L divided by delta T, has this history term for current. Um, it's oriented from left to right. We have a resistance for the capacitance, but that's delta T over 2C. We've got a history term for that capacitor at time T minus delta T. And then this is what I would call the equivalent circuit for the trapezoidal role. Then what we're going to do is we're going to write equations associated with this. And what we're going to do, just like we would do for like a Y bus, is we're going to set this up where we take all the currents going out of each of these different buses and we write a set of equations in, in terms of Kirchhoff current law equations. And so what you're going to see for the first node is you got the current going toward the source on the left. So V1 minus Vs1 over R. You've got the current going down through the capacitor. V over delta T divided by 2C plus a history term for the capacitor. You've got the current going through the right through the inductor. So the difference in voltages divided by 2L over delta T plus this history term for the inductor, all that sums up equal to zero. And you have a similar equation for node number two. And so you got the current now going from right to left through the inductor. You got minus IS2 because we're orient going out of the node. And you basically got two equations. The history terms are basically from the relationships we talked about before. Uh, they don't really depend on the form of the circuit. They just basically are related directly to what are the branch currents and what are the, the node voltages on either end of the element. And then one thing I want to note in here is once you've got a solution for V1 at time T and V2 at time T, uh, what you're going to want to do then is you're going to want to get an update as well for the branch currents because you're going to need those branch currents when you go through the next iteration. It's kind of like if you have a power flow and what the power flow does is it calculates all the node voltages and then once you have the node voltages you get all the line currents. You're doing the same thing here. You get the node voltages first and then you would update the element currents. Okay. So that has to be included in here as, as well. So if I organize these terms, if I organize these terms where I get all the coefficients for V1 and V2 for the first equation and the coefficients for V1 and V2 together on the second equation, you'll have this particular form as shown here. And what you should start to see is this is something we could solve using matrices that basically what I've got is I've got, if I have a, a two by one that represents voltages, that basically these terms, these coefficients on V1 or V2 are admittance types of terms that I could put into a matrix format. And so um, if V is a two by one, then Y is gonna be a two by two matrix. Uh, for the current terms, if I put all the currents on the right hand side, I'll have functions of, I'll have currents that are functions of either current voltage or um, functions of my current source values which are in this part of the expression and then I'll have these history terms which could be represented in here as well and I've, I've seen this in some sources as a minus sign I've seen this as a positive sign I think in the Greenwood book they have a minus sign there so I'm just going to go ahead and keep that the same um, just for the notations consistent but Basically, what I'm going to have is I'm going to have relationships that I can put into a matrix format where this is sort of an admittance matrix. This uh, is the, what I want to solve for. I want to basically solve for this. This is going to be a function of history. And then this is actually a function of what's going on at the present time. Okay, so the currents are kind of broken into currents at the present time versus currents associated with history. But, but anyway, this is something we're familiar working with. I mean, if you were to look at how to solve a power flow, one way you can do something like this, you can make use of these admittance matrix. And so we're creating an admittance matrix which has very, very similar properties to the Y bus that you would have for doing phasor analysis.
So this was, I think, the attractiveness of this approach because given that power system engineers were very familiar with working with YBUS and uh, Y is a sparse matrix, we had all these techniques for working with sparse matrices and for doing power flows, that they kind of saw this as sort of a natural way of extending all this knowledge to doing transit analysis where you come up with a Y bus or admittance matrix is very, very similar to what we had for doing steady state analysis. The diagonal entries of this admittance matrix are just the sum of the admittances connected to each node. The off diagonal terms correspond to the negative of the admittance terms. And so if you look at this form for Y bus, you can see this is the sum. Okay, it's hard for me to write a summation sign. This is basically the sum of the admittance terms. This is minus the admittance term that connects up two nodes which basically is the same rule we have for building a Y bus for steady state power system analysis. Um, so as I said before, the right hand side contains the current injection terms. The first term um, is reflective of the ideal voltage and current sources in the circuit. Uh, in other words, the forcing functions, if you want to think about it that way. And then the second term is based on history. So. Anyway, we could put this into uh, an iterative algorithm. We have to have initial values to start with. Um, one way you could do this is you can have a power flow program and you can get the initial values from there. That's what some codes do. Uh, PSCAD, we just simply have to run it from scratch until we get to the initial values we want. Um, but what we would do is we get a time step and then we would compute the admittance matrix. And if we have a circuit that's going to be linear, that emittance matrix is going to stay the same unless there's like a switching action, let's say. So, so anyway, we increment the time index by the time step. We determine the various current injection terms, um, the small i and the capital I. We solve for voltage. So this is solving something in the form of AX, AX is equal to B. And so basically, there's a lot of techniques for, for getting these voltages. Once we have the voltages and we update the branch currents, and if the simulation is not finished, then you just simply jump up to step number three and you repeat it again. And I'll, and I'll show you an example in MATLAB for how we could do this. So I'm going to go ahead and do go through two examples. I'm going to go ahead and put these in separate video segments. What I'm going to do this by hand and this is actually the problem you had in homework number one that you did it or you solved the differential equation. Now I'm going to show you how you can set it up for a numerical simulation. And then there'll be a more complicated case where I'm going to take a capacitor switching problem and then set up um, EMTP approach in MATLAB where we can actually get the solution.